This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are going to be talking to Trent McConaughey, who is the CTO of Ascribe and Bitchain DB. Uh, Bitchain DB is, a, is aiming to be uh, a, 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 new, a new database technology that can enable eventually a planetary scale database. But before we get into Bitchain DB, let's have an introduction from Trent. Trent, your background and intro, please. Sure. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on here again, guys. I really appreciate whenever you have me on. Um, so I will just make this one quick because I know you're going to dive into some of the details, but I started out, um, spent almost 20 years in the semiconductor industry doing AI for designing computer chips, uh, machine creativity, that sort of thing. A lot of um, big data, a lot of distributed computing, a lot of um, other sort of pedal to the metal sort of coding and whatnot. Um, about um, almost three years ago now, uh, I started working on a project uh, which was uh, for IP on the blockchain with a specific focus on digital art, um, that became Ascribe, the, the company a, and the product. And um, continuing to focus on that as well as more recently, uh, due to limitations we, we saw with blockchain technology, we have built another product called BigchainDB and released that into the market uh, in February. So we'll be t- focusing on that, I guess, in this call. And I look forward to talking about both. Thanks for having me. And so maybe we can get started before we get into Big Chain DB and, and, and cover that topic quite extensively. Uh, talk about uh, Scribe. And since the last time we had you on, it was uh, about 10 months ago, uh, episode 76. For anybody interested, can go back and listen to that episode uh, with Trent. Uh, so tell us how has Scribe uh, moved forward since then? How has the product developed? And uh, you know, what's, what's going on with the Scribe? Sure. So uh, overall, um, Ascribe, uh, the company which has BigchainDB as a product as well as Ascribe the product, and a third product called Where in the Net. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so three products, one company. Um, Ascribe itself, uh, as it, it's actually being quite true to the original vision, which is to make it easy for creators, artists, um, etc., to securely attribute their work onto the blockchain, timestamping it, et cetera, and not only securely attributing it, but also to make it really easy to license it for others, such that, for example, if you're a collector of digital art, or even physical art, actually, if you're a collector, you can truly own that art via a transfer of ownership from the artist to the collector, or perhaps via a gallery and a consignment model, and then from one owner to the next to the next. So where you, whereas before you had uh, no provenance, now you have perfect digital provenance. So that vision is, is as it always has been, and uh, it's been growing quite, quite nicely, actually. So now we're at about 5,000 artists using the system. There are about 9,000 or 10,000 pieces of work, uh, 40,000 editions. Uh, we're seeing heavy usage from many sectors. One of the ones we're most proud of is a lot more people from the Creative Commons community using us. We've worked closely with Creative Commons France um, on that and other organizations related. Um, and actually, we worked to probably there's about um, 20, 25 organizations that have been using us in other interesting ways. So of that, um, several art prizes, probably um, now a total of, I don't know, 10 art prizes. Um, and also sort of the glams, so galleries, libraries, archives, museums, um, using us in various ways um, for things like archival, things like for selling us, uh, s- selling artwork, etc. And then on top of us, we have a REST API. So this has matured a lot since um, February, March, April of last year. And it's really rock solid. Um, and because of that, we've actually had several people starting companies on top of Ascribe. We've got about um, seven or eight startups now that are working on top of Ascribe. Uh, the most recent ones are Left Gallery, which is an initiative from a world-class net artist named Harm van den Dorpel. Um, so it's left.gallery if you go to that. And a more recent one yet is 23VVVIVI. And this is a startup out of the USA, and they are sourcing uh, photography from social media and other places, working with the people creating that, and then selling it. And they even have a secondary market now. Um, limited editions, all this sort of thing. Stuff happening with the scribe, um, which we're quite excited about. Um, 
And I guess the other big thing that we've done, um, you know, that sort of the big B actually quite directly, is uh, with Ascribe, we always saw that people were concerned about sharing their work online. They would say, okay, I get that um, I claim that I own this work, that I have the license to this with all the legals worked out. You know, we have a full-time lawyer, copyright lawyer, that's worked out all the legals in all the countries, kind of make it general. But um, so they got the attribution, but they, they were concerned to share it because they have this feeling that as soon as they put it online, that they lose control over it, um, that they don't have any visibility into where it's going on. So they would say, hey, can you encrypt it for us? Can you watermark it for us? And we're like, no, that totally goes against the point of this, right? Um, that's, you know, it's sort of possible DRM and it's really not the way to go. Um, and we said, okay, instead, um, let's shine a light onto where your work is showing up. So what we did was we crawled the web, uh, works out to 220 terabytes worth of text, if you limit it text. And um, from that, we indexed a bunch of images, 15 billion images. So you look at the links inside the, that, you down, we downloaded those and computed feature vectors from them and basically came up with, it's basically like reverse image search, except it shows you copies versus time. So you can see exactly where your images show up on the web. And that gives you visibility into what's going on. So you regain what would have been a loss of control via visibility. So, and this will lead directly. So we index these 15 billion images. We wanted to record onto the Bitcoin blockchain. We were building on that. We wanted to record onto it that we had cited these, but we did some quick back of the envelope calculations. You know, the Bitcoin network, um, it starts to back up at about 1.5 transactions per second. You know, past it with that, it'll take more than 24 hours for a transaction to go through. So run the numbers, run the numbers, and it will take about a century for 15 billion images to get recorded onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So that was uh, clearly a challenge. Um, and it wasn't just these images, right? You know, we've been iterating with galleries and museums, et cetera, where they have a million images here, 20 million images there, et cetera. They have all these digitalization efforts. And um, any one of those would basically be a showstopper for really putting the stuff onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So it was really starting to hit us really hard um, about the, the limitations of the scalability of the Bitcoin blockchain, right? And people talked about blockchain bloat at 50 gigabytes. I mean, my thumb drive holds more than that. So that clearly something was up. And that's kind of what led us to thinking about how, how, how can we approach this problem? You've indexed 15 billion images. What, what, what kind of server technologies are you using to do that? Oh, we were running on AWS. Um, actually, AWS, um, when we started doing this, um, we hadn't really iterated with them a lot. So they called us up out of the blue and said, like, who are you guys? What's going on? Because our bill was $30,000 a month, actually. So... Uh, we could, we quickly became their friends. <laughs> and, Do you guys have uh, like so, an Amazon rep just working right in your office or something? <laughs> for a while, yeah. I mean, they actually flew down a team from elsewhere in Europe just to come and visit us because, I mean, you know, what crazy little startup in the middle of nowhere? Or actually, it's not the middle of nowhere. Berlin's an amazing city, but what crazy startup, you know, has the audacity to go and uh, crawl the web, right? So we did, um, and it's actually. Less about algorithms, you know, you, you have to have good algorithms, but it's more about commitment of, of time and resources. So we committed it because we saw it as another piece in the puzzle of serving the creators of the internet. And, and so from that problem of, of being able to index and, and, and timestamp all, uh, all of this data, this, uh, this image data, um, you you came up with the idea for Big Chain DB. Uh, can you talk about how that how the how the idea came about? Uh, sure. So so there was the the fifteen billion images challenge, and there's other ones too. You know, one customer we talked to, um, potential customer, they have twenty million users. They're going through more than one one hundred thousand images a day, right? So that would you know roughly double the the throughput right there. So um, and actually that particular customer we were talking to in twenty fourteen, um, in sort of fall of twenty fourteen. Um, you know, we had really started full time on on our, uh, on Ascribe um, in the summer of 2013. Um, sorry, summer of 2014. And uh, so even then, we're like, hmm, you know, this is going to be a challenge. And I even gave a talk. Actually, Brian runs this meetup in Berlin, and I'd been, you know, talking with him over a drink one night about this this problem of Bitcoin. He's like, Trent, you know, you should really talk about this. I'm like, okay, I'll give a talk. You talk. You meet up. Sure. So I did. This was in fall of 2014. And I said, I said, hey, look, you know, like, 
there's the Bitcoin blockchain, here's the scalability issues, right? 1.5 transactions per second, you know, 50 gigabytes, people calling it bloated. And then you look around and you look at the internet and you see, hmm, Netflix is, you know, using up 37% of the bandwidth of the internet. That's interesting. And there's this thing called big data. Well, what's that about, right? How big is that data? And, you know, I knew about this world already quite well because I come from a world of big compute, right? Um, running a thousand, ten thousand machines to do verification of uh, memory chips, etc. So, um, so if you look into this um, this world of big data, it's you know that's the buzzword, but really it comes down to distributed databases, and distributed in the sense of compute resources are spread over more than one physical machine, right? Whether it's processing resources or storage resources or whatever. So there's been distributed database technology um, out for, for decades, actually, and it's gotten really good. And this is what powers Netflix. This is what powers Google. This is what powers um, all the big guys. But guess what? All the little guys, too, right? If you're a, a startup that uh, you know quickly ramps to 10 million, even 50 million users, you're probably running on AWS or maybe Azure or something. And you're just you know paying more money for more compute resources. And it's not just your server in your back office. It's actually just more machines being added to more physical machines being added to, to serve your customers. So there's established technology for this. Um, and in the database world, it's, you know, for the storage side, it's distributed databases. And if you dive deeper, um, yeah, you say, well, you know, you think about, okay, if I put data onto this database, does it get stored on every machine? Uh, well, that wouldn't make it scale. So it only, have to, it only gets stored on a fraction of them, right? So it's this idea that you're sharding up um, your, your data. You know, let's say you have, 100 records to store and you have 100 machines and you can store one record in each machine. Um, but what if one machine goes down? So you have to make sure that you maybe have three or five copies. That's the idea of replication. Um, but you don't have you know, one cop the same copy in every machine, full replication, because that would kill the scalability. So by doing this, if you have three or five copies instead of n copies, um, as you add more and more machines, then the capacity goes up. And if you do things just right, the throughput goes up too. So um, even looking at the benchmarks, you know, in um, fall of 2014, we saw that um, Netflix had done an experiment where they had uh, 50 machines and they were um, getting to 200,000 transactions per second. And as they added more machines, added more machines, it would go, it, um, the, the throughput went up, 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 such that by the time they hit about 300 machines, they were doing more than 1 million transactions per second. So just just when you say transactions, just because I mean we're we're used to using the word transactions in the in the, the blockchain space, but what you actually mean is writes per second in the blockchain or uh, in, actually, in, the, yes, in the database. I apologize, I was being slightly loose there, and you're exactly right. It's writes per second in in, in that sense. Um, interestingly, if you look into the database space, they also use the word transaction um, at a lower level, and a transaction can include you know two writes and a read or one read or whatever. But what I mean here is one database style transaction, which includes one read inside. <laughs> so, so it's kind of funny. There's the sort of transaction in the blockchain sense, transaction in the database sense. Um, and there's also transaction in the financial sense. So you can really get mixed up if, if you're not careful. <laughs> so overall, yeah, I mean, uh, what had led us to this um, was we, we saw, hmm, there's all this technology uh, that is enabling big data, distributed databases. You know, this idea that as you add more resources, um, hard drives, et cetera, then you can increase capacity um, storage as well as increase throughput. And that's pretty profound, right? And this, this is actually what powers um, all these big data um, challenges. You know, this is why, um, you know, a, a smallish network is like Visa or MasterCard. You know, we're talking 2,000, 5,000 um, transactions per second in the sort of Visa sense in this, in this way. Or Twitter, you know, 5,000 per second. Um, a bad at network is 100,000 per second. A good one is 500,000 per second, right? So, um, you know, and compare that to Bitcoin, which is, you know, practically speaking, 1.5 transactions per second. So we're talking, you know, four, five, six orders of magnitude difference. And if you want to have a network, um, a, a database network, um, you want to support more than just one application, right? You don't want to be running, um, well, you might want to be running, say, just Visa or just SwiftNet or something. But if you're doing something on a global scale, you actually want to be handle, handling um, a whole bunch of different use cases. So, so this is you know what we were looking at. But we also saw that even for our own needs in a scribe, you know, we have these 15 billion uh, images that we wanted to index. So, um, and we wanted to put them on where it wouldn't cost us you know 
if we said, hey, we're going to pay the 10 cents per transaction or whatever it costs these days to store, $1.5 billion. Can't really go to a VC for that one, can you? <laughs> Let's take a short break so I can take you to Paris. I walked into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, in the heart of Silicon Sentier, home to many startups, including Ledger. And I spoke with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger's CEO, about the all-new unplugged NFC hardware wallet. The Ledger Unplugged is an NFC-based hardware wallet that you can use with compatible Android phones. The private keys are stored in a secure element and you can use them with wallets such as Mycelium and Greenbits. Each time you want to make a transaction, the signature will be done by the Unplugged and this way your private keys is critical data will never be exposed to the Android phone. This is a secure way to use your Bitcoins on the go, in mobility, and you will also be able to pay directly with the Unplugged with compatible point-of-sale terminals. The Ledger Unplugged is the simple solution for secure, contactless Bitcoin payments. You can get the Unplugged at ledgerwallet.com, and when you use the code EPICENTER at checkout, you'll get 10% off your order. And by the way, that code works on their entire range of products. So we'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. So... In what a lot of companies have resorted to doing, and certainly what we're doing at Stratum is we're using Merkle trees uh, to, to 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 put large amounts of uh, of hash data into one single Bitcoin transaction. Why did you feel that that wasn't a good solution? Yeah. So we well we were looking around right, and um, we, we we asked ourselves the question. Um, there's two ways to get to scale. One of them is to start with blockchain technology and try to scale it up using various tricks and ideas, um, maybe from distributed databases, maybe with Merkle hashing, et cetera. The other way is to start with distributed database technology that already scales and try to blockchainify it. And of course, we had to figure out what the word blockchainify meant in a practical sense. I can get at that. And um, But overall, it's really these two options, right? Um, blockchainify big data or big datafy blockchain, right? Um, now, if you look at the, the history of work that's been done in, in blockchain world, right? Um, um, some of it goes back to time stamping literature of the early 90s, um, but it really took off, of course, and then the cypherpunks, et cetera, but it really took off um, with uh, Bitcoin release. Um, but if you look at the world of databases, distributed databases and so on, this goes back to the 50s and 60s. There's a much longer history, a much longer lineage, and a much larger amount of R&D that has been done and technology that has been developed. And it's not just about scale. It's not just about performance uh, in terms of throughput, capacity, and latency. It's also querying. It's also permissioning and all of these other things, right? And if you want to do querying over a distributed database, that is actually a huge amount of engineering work um, that you have to do. You have to optimize to minimize latency, et cetera. And the idea of a query itself, right? It goes back to a ton of amazing research um, in the late 60s, early 70s that led directly to relational databases and what we now think of SQL, and we think of it as the most mundane thing in the world, but it's incredibly powerful. One line of SQL replaces 500 lines of custom code for your one application, right? So if you're thinking about how do you manipulate data, do you prefer to write you know, one or a few lines of SQL, or are you gonna write you know, 50 or 500 lines of custom code? So, so this is the, basically the choice though, right? Um, you can take a blockchain and try to scale it up and somehow bolt on, you know, um, all this other work too with querying and permissioning, or you can start with a distributed database and all that, you know, 50 years, the thousands of man years worth of research um, in distributed databases, and then bolt on um, the benefits that you get from blockchain ideas. So we went for the latter. And we, as far as I know, are really the only ones that really went that way. Um, but it's worked out marvelously. Happy to share our details. Cool, it, it, it does seem like a, like, like a really cool idea. <clears throat> But for starters, let's just walk through all the participants in a, let's say, a big chain DB implementation, right? So when we, when a, for our listeners and us, when we think of Bitcoin, we tend to think like, okay, there are different participants. There's the people that are submitting transactions, the transactors, there are the nodes that verify the transactions, the proof of work miners that create the blocks. These are all the participants. So with big chain DB, you are eventually going to release, let's say, a public big chain that is like Bitcoin, like a public database anyone can write to, who would the participants in the system be? What are the different categories? Yeah, sure. So 
this is probably drilling a little too deep uh, earlier in the, the call, but I'm happy to, to talk about it. So um, first of all, um, big chain DB can be deployed in private scenarios and public scenarios. You know, people can take it right now and put it out as a public network for themselves right now, right? Uh, we are working on rolling our own deployment for a public one, um, working with a whole bunch of participants on that. And um, when people uh, go to use it, anyone will be able to read anything. Anyone will be able to issue an asset. Anyone will be able to transfer an asset. Um, and uh, there can be other permissionings too, if you like, but for the public one, it's basically going to be very, very, very open. Um, the one thing that isn't um, as open is simply validating. Um, but right now, if you, you know, if you want to be a validator on the Bitcoin network, you have to spend $50 million for the compute hardware to have any chance. So, um, uh, and you know, that's, that's basically for the public uh, big chain DB um, deployment that we're working on. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about briefly, just before you know, we kind of drill down uh, to this too much, is um, just to go back to Sebastian's question. When it comes to you know, when you want to scale up, it's kind of clear everyone kind of understands sort of what in, as a noun does. Uh, but when you want, when you want to take a distributed database and blockchainify it, you know, what does blockchain mean as an adjective, right? What does it mean to blockchainify something um, to make a blockchain database? So we actually looked around and, you know, we'd spent, uh, you know, um, two years already in, in the space, right? Since summer of 2013, working on Ascribe um, as the project and the company. Um, and we, we had a, a very good idea of the different benefits that emerge and sort of the technical ideas that led to them. Um, so we like to find blockchain as an adjective, meaning three specific things, decentralized, immutable, and assets. Decentralized, as in no single entity owns or controls. Immutable, as in resistant, as in more tamper resistant than a traditional logging databases, because databases already have logs. Uh, and tamper, sorry, um, and assets, as in assets can actually live on this database, um, of which you need a prerequisite of the first two things, decentralized and immutable. And live, as in you can issue assets, you can transfer assets, and they can just kind of be there. Um, you don't need to have some other sort of means for them to exist. You can treat that as the main means. And of course, you can have recording contracts and all these other sorts of things around it too. But overall, it's just this idea that assets, assets can be um, issued and transferred um, within this database network. So that, that's really key because you know, with that definition, then we asked, OK, we want to decentralize this. How do we do that? OK, we want immutability. How do we do that? OK, we want assets. How do we do that? And that's what led us down the path. Um, you know, how do we do that um, on top of an existing distributed database? So, uh, so what are the kinds of uh, characteristics that your approach enables right, in terms of performance, uh, transaction latency, right latency, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So um, overall, um, it's the traditional performance characteristics that you might see in um, a database that people measure, but also what is it that our customers care about and whatnot, right? And, you know, Ascribe has been our lead customer. So Ascribe, you know, one of the things was capacity, right? We've got 15 billion records that we want to write, but not just that, you know, another 20 million here, another 20 million there, et cetera. So you have to have the capacity to store uh, these records as in the metadata, right? Um, the media blobs themselves, Databases aren't designed to store that those directly, right? This is where file systems come in well. Whether it's S3, whether it's IPFS running on S3 or IPFS running in someone's garage, someone's garage right? So uh, media blobs are well suited to things like S3 and IPFS. Um, it, so it's really about um, you know capacity is one. Another one is throughput. That's really important because you know if you can only get you know a few transactions per second going through, you'll never have something um, you know even city scale, let alone planetary scale, right? Um, and there's lots of examples, right? I can throw throw a rock and find a banking app that will need a thousand transactions per second, let alone ten thousand or a hundred thousand. Um, anything IoT level, right? You know, um, even a small IoT deployment will have a thousand or ten thousand nodes, at which you can easily hit a thousand transactions per second, right? Or energy metering, right? If, if you've got, you know, uh, fifty million meters, um, numbers I hear are, are on the order of fifty thousand transactions per second, recording what's going on in those meters, right? So capacity. Um, throughput. Another one that's very important, depending on the application, is latency. 
So it doesn't matter so much in things like art, right? Where, you know, an artist makes a piece every now and, you know, maybe one piece a day or one a week or maybe one a month. And, you know, that piece maybe gets resold maybe, you know, five times in a hundred years, right? But it does matter for um, other applications, um, things like financial, right? So if you're doing FX trading, you're dead in the water if you're running 100 milliseconds, right? So, um, but you can get away with 30 milliseconds. If you're doing high speed trading, you're actually dead in the water if you're doing one millisecond, right? So there you need super dedicated hardware. You need to be running on in-memory um, databases. Uh, you need other dedicated hardware. You need to be right next to the trading floor, et cetera, et cetera. And there's lots of sort of deep, deep, deep engineering optimization that you need for that. And, um, you know, what's cool is the team inside Ascribe, it's a bunch of engineers who have come from pedal to the metal engineering, right? Semiconductor design, aerospace design, chemical um, engineering, et cetera, where we're used to doing things where that they're running at a million transactions per second, et cetera. So this does not scare us. This is to us, it's you know exciting. It's a challenge. So um, that's, that's three things then as sort of key performance characteristics that we like to think about. Capacity, throughput, and latency. Uh, there's others, but those are, you know, uh, really important. And then besides that, I guess, sort of for database, sorry, um, you'll see that we list this elsewhere too, um, querying. So the ability to query to, in, the, in the first place, and then efficient querying. So, you know, how efficiently does it look up? And querying also includes um, how do you do a write, right? So a query isn't just about a read, it's also about a write. And then finally permissioning, right? So um, does it support permissioning? How does that work? So those are sort of characteristics that, that matter. The last one's measurable, benchmarkable, the first ones are, right? Yeah. So. So yeah, so let's let's review the five things. So one is uh, raw capacity, like how much how much aggregate data can can a particular database technology store? Like in Bitcoin, that's fifty GB. Yep. The uh, the the second is uh, throughput, which means like which in Bitcoin we can think of as transactions a second. So you know three transactions a second or whatever. The third thing is latency. How much time does it take since the client submits a transaction for it to be irrevocably confirmed? Right, so in Bitcoin that might be an hour, and then uh, it's squaring ability, which Bitcoin doesn't have, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, and then finally, uh, it's um, what was the fifth thing? Uh, querying ability and and permissioning, right? Like uh, being the ability to restrict certain participants to predefined roles, right? So. In terms of benchmarks, have you benchmarked the system? And yep. for the for the first three for the first three things, uh, st uh, storage capacity, transaction latency, and transaction throughput. What are the kinds of results you got for Big Chain DB? Yeah, for sure. So I'll just go in the order that it's gone before. So for capacity, um, uh, and basically before, maybe before I get there, right? So a lot of the people in the audience, I'm sure, are very familiar with Bitcoin. Um, one of the things that you know Bitcoin has, it's fully replicated, right? Which means that every single node stores all the data. But if you want to have any sort of scale at all and any size at all, that means that every single node has to be storing a huge amount of data, right? You know, um, and it's sort of like it encourages centralization because who's going to have the capacity to store, you know, 50 exabytes of data or even pe a petabyte of data, right? Um, so uh, it, it's kind of interesting um, and even the bandwidth to support that. So having a, a smaller number um, uh, of, of replicates actually makes a big difference. So um, capacity, if you say, I'm going to have a replication factor of one or three or five instead of a van, what that means is as you increase your total number of nodes, then you are increasing your capacity, right? In a linear fashion, right? Um, replication factor of one means, you know, two X to nodes, two X to capacity. Replication fac uh, factor of three, it's still linear relation, right? So linear scaling and capacity. Um, we set things up where if you're running on an Amazon Web Services XL instance, that's 48 terabytes. And um, working with the database we, technology we work with, um, each you can have 32 shards. So 48 terabytes times 32 shards gives you more than a petabyte. So we talked about that in the paper. Um, we, we claim petabyte capacity. Um, that's on that example there. Um, there's other ways you can roll things where you have even um, higher storage per node, but um, that's one example. Uh, on the next one, throughput. So um, this one was very important to us to do a good job on because you know, as we're aiming towards this database that can help to power the planet, um, how do you get to a scale that helps, right? Um, 
And uh, by the way, too, uh, global email, we ran some numbers. And by our estimations, uh, email is running at 3.2 million transactions per second. So there's 3.2 million emails go floating around the world on average every second. So um, of course, there's spikes and stuff, but that's what the average is for one day. Um, so throughput, um, it kind of it's interesting for orders of magnitude, right? For, for to get a feel. Uh, so for throughput, that was really our aim was to actually get to uh, one million writes per second, and um, we actually um, actually had a lot of iterations uh, when we started working on the Big Chain DB project um, in the late summer of last year, of 2015. We said, okay, um, whatever we do, we have to um, you know make this thing go fast. So we designed it. Um, in a way where one of the constraints we realized was as you add nodes, um, you have to let the throughput go up, right? In, in the way that traditional distributed databases do. So that was a very explicit design decision that we made. And um, as we were going along, then um, we were basically experimenting with different approaches, you know, designing different algorithms, trying them, seeing what they got in the way. And we managed to sort of structure things such that at the end of the day, our algorithms that added decentralization, immutability, and assets didn't get in the way of the raw performance of the database itself. And that's really, really key. You know, the database itself, what it does, this is, I can get into this later, but what it does on its own is ordering. Like, that's the core thing that a database does, is ordering. Um, you know, you've got this replicated, you know, the theoretical approach is you've got this replicated state machine or state machine. And it's creating, um, each one of the server nodes is creating a log, and you want all the logs to kind of in sync, right? And um, so data, distributed databases do this, right? This is actually the essence of them. And then you have this all, all this infrastructure on top. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that uh, you have to let the database, the distributed database, keep doing its thing, creating that log, creating that log, each machine, each server having maintaining its own state. And then all these things that we do on top just get out of the way uh, while you know, achieving our, our goals of decentralization, immutability, and assets. So um, for that, um, as we went along, we, we, we managed to get everything out of the way. And then we said, OK, great. Now we can benchmark um, this distributed database itself um, because all the other algorithms are out of the way. And we benchmarked, benchmarked. And at first, the numbers were so-so, but not amazing. What happened, we actually discovered several bugs in, in this distributed database that we made up. We, just, we had decided to work on. Um, and so we iterated very closely with them, uh, with uh, the developers of the database, um, and they fixed the bugs. They had very good turnaround. They were really excellent. So um, so we actually helped them to achieve their database to get the scale they needed. And this is uh, RethinkDB. They're a really great company. Um, it's a JSON-style document store we built on. So we basically inherit all the benefits of RethinkDB, including performance. It's designed as a real-time database. JSON store, which means it speaks the language of the browser, you know, JavaScript, um, and and JSON, um, and has you know excellent scalability. So in the end, we managed to uh, have this plot that we're very proud of, which is showing um, the increase going um, up to one million writes per second as we increase up to 32 nodes. So that's throughput, latency. Um, this really the big big bottleneck in latency is um, the thing that slows you down, it's kind of funny, it's the speed of light, <laughs> right? So um, the speed of light is slow, it, it really is. You know, if you're um, you know, trying to do, even if you have um, a database technology that is perfect, that takes zero time to do uh, anything you want, you know, infinitely fast, um, you'll never able to do, be able to do FX trading um, in a WAN setting um, because you know, 100 milliseconds um, is, uh, the limit for FX trading, yet it takes you um, about, I believe it's 150 milliseconds to go halfway around the planet. <laughs> so, you know, a round trip, 300 milliseconds, I forget the exact number, um, it's too slow. So um, it depends on the application. So um, latency really depends if you're in a single data center, then, um, or within a sing single region, then you don't have to worry about, you know, the travel that way and it starts to matter, but you can actually get things down to, um, the, the speed needs of things like FX trading, right? Um, with the right optimizations. Uh, when it comes to the other things where you're like, for example, the public big chain DB, um, where it is a WAN setting, you're going to have delays, but that's okay, right? Um, the consensus algorithm it, uh, is designed to handle that. That's actually what a consensus algorithm does. It's about keeping all of the, the different uh, nodes in sync and knowing what isn't in sync and knowing what is, right? So, um, and you know, for everything to be in sync where you're more satisfied about it, it might be half a second. Um, that's okay. 
right? Um, because typically the WAN, the full WAN settings that you need, this is things for like Arch and Diamonds and IP. That's fine, right? If you really need speed and WAN, then you have some sort of hierarchical structure. And I see this, right? You know, people might do FX trading in New York and they might do it in London. And then they have some sort of way to reconcile that, but um, sort of at a, at a different level. So that's latency. Um, we continue to do very extensive benchmarking. We've got um, engineers dedicated on that full time, um, benchmarking these things in more and more detailed ways, and also understanding the effect of different um, faults, et cetera. Things like, you know, as you have a heavier, heavier DDoS attack, how does that impact throughput, right? So uh, this matters. And then finally, to, towards your question of scalability, um, I guess I implicitly answered in the other ones, right? So as you increase the number of nodes, capacity goes up, throughput goes up. Um, latency um, goes down simply because you need um, the majority of nodes to agree on this, right? So um, if they're spread out, um, then, uh, you know, on average, you, you've just got um, statistics working against you. But it's not, you know, horrible slowdown. And typically, you know, it's not like we're going for a thousand server nodes. You're typically talking, you know, on the order of 10, 20, 30 server nodes, right? So, and that's a very different thing. You could have thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of clients. That's fine. But for the server nodes themselves, it's actually a relatively small number. So that's why um, um, you know, latency doesn't totally kill you that way. Today's magic word is big, B-I-G. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So if we're talking about uh, the, the 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 public uh, uh, big chain DB that that will be re- will be released, um, so I I think we can all agree that the latency will not be the same as if you're operating in a private setting uh, mm-hmm. with with servers that are close by. I mean that, that that's just logic. Um, is there some point where throughput and latency and scalability sort of cap out uh, at when you reach a certain number of nodes, or are we talking about like infinite? Scalability. I mean, I guess the latency you're you're limited there, but the the scalability and the throughput aspects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. Latency you're limited. Um, silly speed of light, darn physics. Um, but uh, um, with with capacity, right? Um, the way that uh, RethinkDB is designed right now, it has a fixed number of shards. You can keep swapping out um, any given uh, shard and actually having more sort of virtual storage within each. That's one way. The other way that we see is simply having databases sitting side by side by side by side where they have um, basically a, um, a shared namespace um, with things like IPLD, et cetera. So um, we can get into that in a bit if you like. But overall, um, it allows the sort of horizontal scaling because you can actually have um, yeah, databases sitting side by side by side. That, that said, it's still nice to have you know, as much as you can in a single database because um, it helps to make the querying much more efficient. But you can actually go from one to two to five to ten plus databases. Right? Okay. So this this week actually, you you uh, announced your your partnership with uh, RethinkDB. So um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but so uh, Big Chain DB is is built on on top. It, it adds functionality to to RethinkDB. That's correct. Okay. So uh, RethinkDB is a distributed database system, as you mentioned, that is mm-hmm. a, a JSON store uh, in a sort of traditional da- distributed database. Uh, schema that we might think of, and then BigchainDB adds the all of the blockchain. Um, I'm putting in quotes here features uh, such as permissions and consensus, etc. Um, can Can you talk about so sort of that partnership and how those two services work together? So, so before you answer, I so I installed it uh, earlier, and the way that you the way that it works is that you you install RethinkDB first, and then you install Big chain DB, and I guess it's sort of an extension um, mm-hmm. to that, that that technology. Yeah, sure. So, um, so basically, uh, it's worth mentioning. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, permissioning and consensus. So, rethink DB actually, um, up until very recently, they didn't have a permissioning system um, uh, shipped. Um, they've been working on one since last fall, and they just shipped one actually this past week as well. So, they have a very nice permissioning system. Um, we build a. We have different type of permissioning on top. So if you think about, you know, a, um, a transaction in a in a blockchain type setting, um, permissioning is based on private keys, 
um, and you know which signatures do you need signed to go through things like uh, multi-sig crypto signatures this sort of thing right and so um, we have that sort of permissioning um, and we, we really sort of a version one of our transactions that was just a very simple transaction you know one input one output um, not much more um, and we're in the process of releasing a v2 that has all these much more sort of you know fancier features um, multiple inputs multiple outputs multi say um, uh, thresholds um, and sort of a more uh, general way to specify some crypto crypto constraints um, it's not Turing complete doesn't have loops and none of that. It's not trying to because the smart contract decentralized processing is complementary, but it makes it easy to do things like escrow at volume. So, um, so basically, permissioning actually kind of breaks down in a couple of ways, right? There's these things like crypto conditions, and then there's permissioning in the traditional way, um, where you know this identity on this network has uh, the ability to issue assets, or this identity has the ability to to read. Uh, we are holding back from actually implementing that ourselves until RethinkDB came out um, with their permissioning system. Now that it's out, um, we will um, be moving towards supporting that more directly in BigchainDB. So we talk about it in the white paper. It's one of the things in the white paper that it wasn't out right on the very first release, but it's coming down the pipe. Uh, you also talked about consensus. So this is actually you know really important to stress. Um, a distributed database, uh, by its nature, um, how, how do the nodes keep in sync, right? How do they, um, how does, how does the data keep in sync from one to the next to the next? That's a consensus algorithm, right? And um, even modern consensus algorithms um, go back to um, research at Microsoft from a guy named Leslie Lamport. He wrote this really wonderful paper in 1982 where he, he actually defined the Byzantine general's problem, right? Um, and then proposed a solution to it. And over the years, um, um, that technology got better, 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 that, uh, that line of research. In 1990, he came up with an algorithm. He actually set out to prove that it wasn't possible to do a certain class of consensus, um, to solve a certain class of consensus problems. Um, and in the process of trying to prove it wrong, he accidentally discovered the solution. <laughs> and it's called Paxos. He tried submitting the paper in 1990. Um, the referees thought it wasn't interesting enough, so he's like, ah, forget about it. But then things got more important again with the rise of the web, and uh, he finally published the paper in 1998. It's notorious for being hard to understand, um, but it's actually it's more straightforward than people realize too. So, and there's nicer explanations out there now by Lamport himself as well as others. So the um, and there's derivatives of Paxos out there, right? Um, things like Raft and many others that have improved upon this over the years. It's a well-established, um, you know, consensus algorithms are a well-established technology. Once again, this is the this is one of the core technologies that helps to power, you know, big data and the modern internet. Um, so. We, uh, inside RethinkDB, it uses Raft, and um, therefore, at the very, very core of BigchainDB, there is Raft as well. We have um, a consensus algorithm on top as well. Can, can you explain how, how it works and how, how it's different from, say, proof of work? Uh, yeah, point? sure. So um, uh, we have a two-layer consensus algorithm, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back, sure, happy to. So proof of work, um, basically, every 10 minutes, there's a lottery to decide um, on um, one of the the, no, the server nodes, aka miners, gets to say um, gets to make a call on what transactions get committed to the the chain, and um, he so and that lottery is based on how much electricity he spends, assuming equal ASIC power, etc. So that's fine, you know. These days it takes a lot of money to have any fighting chance at all, but that's kind of proof of work, right? So it's it's lottery based. Once every ten minutes, um, one one node makes a vote, and um, and then you know, on average, ten minutes later, the next you know someone else gets to win, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it follows this longest chain rule, which means to be really sure that you really do have the longest chain, you probably have to wait around for two or three or four, or five, six transactions. And even in the original Bitcoin white paper, he talks about the sort of the probability that you've got the longest chain based on how many um, how many transactions have gone through or how many blocks have gone through. Um, so it's a consensus algorithm, but it's actually quite slow, right? Um, you're going to have to wait for 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes um, for it. That's proof of work, proof of stake. Uh, traditional proof of stake is um, basically your uh, probability of getting to vote to um, say good, yes or no, is proportional to how much money you have in the system, how much you know intrinsic internal cryptocurrency, et cetera. 
there was clearly problems with that. You know, people have identified many attack vectors. So people started engineering improvements around it. Around it. Where, um, and what we've arrived to today with proof of stake, it actually looks a lot more like a federation. Um, and maybe I'll describe federation and come back to proof of work. A federation is simply, um, a basic federation is, you know, you've got five nodes, 10 nodes, 25 nodes, whatever. And for some transaction to go through, some quorum has to say, yes, this is good. It could be three, it could be five, it could be a majority, whatever. Um, a majority or two thirds is typically a good idea, depending on what sort of assumptions you're making. So that's a federation. Um, how do you choose who are the members in the federation? There's various ways, right? Um, the original Hyperledger project, for example, was based on saying, do you have an SSL certificate? Or you can say, hey, um, you know, bank A, bank B, bank C, bank D, you're all my buddies. I'm bank E, we're going to make a federation together. We know each other's um, public keys. That's my list of, of approved nodes. We're good to go. Um, so proof of stake, how it's evolved with things like Casper, et cetera, is um, it's a federation with very, very dynamic membership um, based on uh, a cryptocurrency. And um, that's cool, right? Um, it basically means you have a very open membership because you have a lot of the complexities, but the complexities are basically mostly um, around you know, the, the rules for membership. Uh, but you can have very simple rules too, or you can have external governance, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of overall, you know, the really three main types of ways to approach this is proof of work, proof of stake, and traditional um, federation style consensus. Um, and then sort of on top of that though, um, you know, when you have consensus, you could, you could say, I'm tolerant to just crash faults. I'm tolerant to crash faults and arbitrary malicious faults. Um, and then on top of that, you could say, I'm going to allow fully open membership to let anyone come in and, and do anything uh, and maybe be an, um, an authenticator, right? And that's all it's membership thing. Um, this could be a yeah, proof of work system. You know, um, of course, to be uh, have any chance at all, you need to spend a lot of money um, on mining equipment. Or um, another example is something like the Stellar consensus protocol, where you know everyone makes a call on who else gets to uh, like who do they trust. So if I want to trade with you, um, Sebastian, then um, you know you've decided that you've got um, so, say 10 people on a list that you might possibly trust. I've decided that I've got 20. And there's an overlap of four people, so it's really it comes down to those four people that we trust together. So with with, with that, what what is the consensus model in uh, in blockchain DB? Sorry, like? sorry about <laughs> that. Yeah, um, no, no, no. I, it's, it's great to it's great to give uh, to give a broad overview of all yeah. the consensus uh, yeah. models and it's drill down. Yeah, get, no, it's get, get important to understand. Yeah. But there, there's a long history. Yeah, there's a long history to this, right? Consensus did not start with Satoshi. There's this huge um, belief that he did and he walks in water and a bunch of other things. Yeah, people, and that's people fine that. if people want to um, you know, not look into the history of computing, but we care about the history of computing because there's a lot of great ideas. Um, so what we have inside BigchainDB, it's basically two level consensus. At the lowest level is within RethinkDB, and that is Raft, which is part of the lineage of Paxos. Um, it's designed to be um, more modular, more easy, easy to use, um, sort of like building blocks that are sort of high impedance to each other. So it's sort of easier to compose them and, and reason about. Um, and it is um, crash tolerant, but not Byzantine fault tolerant, not, not uh, fully tolerant to arbitrary attacks. Uh, one level up, um, and this is part of the big chain DB um, server code, et cetera. Um, we have technology, uh, we call it the um, big chain consensus algorithm, and it does voting. So basically, remember how I mentioned before, it's all about the order, it's all about the order. You want to get out of the way of the database when it's writing. Um, so we, le we let the writes come in. We don't, uh, one node will vet them, but then we write as soon as we can, as soon as we can, as soon as we can into the, the list of the ones that are there for good. But they're not vetted. We just let them write. Why? Because it's much faster to just let it write, let it write, get out of the way. But then after the fact, what we do, is we let the federation nodes vote. They they basically each says yes, this transaction is good, or no, it's not. It's good if every single transaction inside is good. Um, the block isn't good if um, any transaction is bad. So um, that emerges as consensus at a higher level for that block. And um, if you think about it, um, you could actually do this one transaction at a time, but we simply group them into blocks for speed um, because it takes you know time to 
hash a set of transactions and write it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so we group them for speed, um, no more, no less. And if a block gets, um, you know, if the majority of uh, nodes, voters say, yes, this block is good, then it's considered good. And um, then anyone else doing reading afterwards um, it has said, knows that it's, it's usable, that it's a truth. Um, if the nodes vote and the majority says it's bad, then it's considered you know, not truth. And any transactions that are still possibly um, OK get copied back into this sort of incoming buffer and, and tried again. So basically, in this mechanism, we've got two levels of consensus. The lower level is fault tolerant, and the higher level is um, the lower level is crash fault tolerant. The higher level is crash fault tolerant plus plus. So it's got a bunch of other mechanisms in place to um, validate and vet and verify. And as time goes on, we are making this more and more um, uh, resistant as well towards a Byzantine fault tolerance. And in fact, we have some pieces of technology right now um, that we're iterating against to, to make it um, do that in many settings. So uh, as, as a summary, so two levels of consensus, the lower level is raft, which is not Byzantine fault tolerant, but crash fault tolerant. Yep. And then the layer on, uh, so, so there's basically one level of consensus that tells all the nodes what data to put in. And it yep. takes all sorts of data, like, you know, correct transactions, incorrect transactions, et cetera. And then once all of the transactional data is inside the database, then another level of consensus, which is nodes voting to order these transactions into blocks, into valid blocks. Uh, not quite. So it's not voting to order the transactions in a box. So the thing is, like, even a fault tolerant database, you know, running raft, whatever, right? It's already ordering. Databases do this. They need this to do the logs, right? It's built into the database, right? Satoshi didn't invent ordering, right? So, um, and you get out of the way and let the database write these orders itself, right? Um, so at the, at the lowest level, all the ordering is being done. And actually, it's being grouped into blocks there, too, because you can. The thing at the higher level that's being happened is it's voting on whether any given block is valid or not. And it's valid as long as any transaction in the block, like as, as long as all the transactions in the block are valid. Okay, so the lower level is imposing the ordering and the higher level might be imposing, say, that no extra money is created or the kind of, um, yeah. So basically, right. like, what, yeah. what prevents double spending is the higher level of consensus yeah. and the lower level uh, tells us what transactions happened and which came first. Exactly. And, okay. and, and this is absolutely critical to performance. So basically, the bottleneck is in rights. Right. So um, if you can actually manage to get the throughput for writing really, really high by, you know, letting the distributed database do its thing, do its thing, write, 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 then you're okay. And um, for, for the writing, but then you have to say, okay, um, should everyone trust what just got written? And that's what this higher level consensus is about, right? And that higher level, though, it's actually just voting as well. Um, you know, each one of the nodes is doing its own writing. So there's, but there's no sort of central blocker, right? So um, this is sort of the breakthrough. It's sort of reordering um, what's happening, letting you know ordering happening with this you know big data distributed database technology that you know runs fast already, but um, bringing in uh, the decentralized control via uh, the nodes having a say on whether a block is valid or not. So, uh, like one of the interesting things in your white paper is. Uh... Is you is is sort of your claim that big chain DB implementations can't fork? Is that is that correct? And why why is it so? Yeah. So this comes down to once again, um, if you think about a distributed database, a traditional one, right? Um, each one of those server nodes is writing a log, right? It's just writing a log, one order, then then the next, then the next, then the next. This is the essence of a consensus algorithm, a traditional one, right? Like Paxos or Raft or one of these. So. Um, it's not like Paxos says, okay, suddenly, um, you know, imagine you're writing a piece of code and it's a for loop, um, right? Or um, can that for loop code suddenly be mutated such that it's um, like splitting into a, a nested loop? You know, like it's just not kind of in the code at all anywhere. You don't have the constructs, right? So um, it, within distributed databases, there is no construct for a fork because just those, you know, abstractions haven't been built in. They would have to be built in at the very core, right? And 
And that central problem of, of sorting out ordering, like solving ordering, is exactly what Paxos and Raft do. And it's just an order. That's no more, no less, right? Um, you you can't, they're just slotted in there and that's it. And it's sort of how the order is resolved is um, based on what's getting stored within each server node and then what is the protocol of rules around um, how to interpret that from each other server node. So basically order is input, like order is comes as a you know first class citizen with traditional uh, consensus algorithms like Paxos and um, forking is not even in their vocabulary. Uh, so let's, let's talk about some of the applications uh, for Beijing DB. Uh, one, what I really like about the, the website is that um, you have some really nice illustrations there on how Beijing DB can be implemented in sort of more, I guess, traditional uh, centralized uh, infrastructure where you would have like an Amazon uh, Web Services instance and, and a database, etc., and all the way to having it completely decentralized uh, with Ethereum running as the VM and IPFS as the file system and, and, and the Big Chain DB as the data store. Um, could you talk about sort of the different use cases and what, what would be some practical applications for each of those types of scenarios? Sure, sure, yeah. So uh, to sort of summarize, right, there's um, a, a framework in which you can use, or a, a, a style of deployment where you can use BigchainDB where you keep your stack the same, right? And you just, um, and right now, you maybe you're running in your stack, you've got, you know, five different databases. You've got, you know, maybe MySQL for your SQL database and maybe MongoDB for your NoSQL database and maybe, you know, Neo4j for a graph database or something. And maybe some others too, just for fun, right? It's pretty common these days. Um, so guess what? You throw in another database, right? Um, this one though is special, Big Chain DB, because you uh, um, don't, you as yourself, don't own or control that yourself. It's it's you and this federation of other organizations in your ecosystem, right? So as far as your sysadmin is concerned, and your developers and your CIO, etc., um, you've got this other database that you're, you, you know, you've got hooked into your system. But it's special because it's data that you and the other organizations in your ecosystem are working on against together, right? So that's really cool because it means that you can, you know, maintain the rest of your stack. You don't have to go, you know, all in. Um, you can just bring extra benefits um, to some of your existing applications. Or you can also another way to think about this is you're thinking about a new application, uh, but you only really need to have, say, timestamping, right? Um, you don't need to have full-on decentralized processing um, or full-on decentralized media storage. So great, you have your team of developers that understand modern web stacks or modern enterprise stacks, just use them, right? Keep doing that stack. Now you just have a new database that you can plug in and use um, to get some of these main benefits of decentralized. And we know this very well because, you know, this is how we built Describe for IP. Um, you know, we, we, we came up with this idea in 2013, you know, long before um, Ethereum, you know, the Ethereum white paper came out six, six months later. And um, and there had been talk of this, you know, in various places and stuff. But um, what's cool is, uh, you know, Ascribe itself is running on on a modern web stack. Um, all the components you would expect running on AWS, et cetera, Heroku, et cetera. Um, and at the place that where, where the rubber hits the road, that really matters uh, for, you know, who owns what, that is on a decentralized database. Um, right now, it's on Bitcoin. We're in the process of porting it over. Um, we will fully deploy it um, when the public big chain DB it goes live. Um, and uh, so that's a good example there. Um, and I'll, so I'll talk about general, and then I'll talk about some very specific use cases. Um, so the general, there's you know sort of the partly decentralized um, stack that I just described, which is really easy to adopt, especially for the enterprise. The other stack is sort of this full-blown, fully decentralized um, stack, um, which we're very excited about. Um, of course, it can be deployed in a private setting. Many people are um, for things like business logic or for um, lots of other applications. Um, but what's really exciting to me is the, the public deployment, where you have this you know, world computer, as a lot of the Ethereum folks talk about, which I think is uh, really awesome, right? Um, and so you can have a decentralized database, really you know, a planetary scale database that no one owns or controls. Um, a decentralized file system, which and it's IPFS is emerging as the winner there, um, and uh, processing on top. And um, 
Ethereum public database is uh, sorry, Ethereum uh, public network is certainly the leader here. Um, there's some other technologies we believe that are really interesting and helpful there too. Things like Tendermint, where you can actually have decentralized processing with other languages, right? Um, the Ethereum uh, VM is really designed for Solidity, the Ethereum language, um, which is really great for a lot of applications. But uh, for other developers who you know have a lot of code in Python or only really feel comfortable in JavaScript, then um, that's cool too because you have um, things like Tendermint. So um, and these things together, right? Decentralized processing, along with decentralized storage, um, and finally um, decentralized communication, just sort of built into the protocols and stuff. That is really the elements of comp computing. Um, i.e., you know, together, working together, uh, a world computer, right? Um, and then there's the applications on top, right? Uh, decentralized apps, dApps. Um, and, you know, there's already starting to be an explosion of them, um, thanks to especially Ethereum um, and elsewhere too. And that's very exciting. Um, and of course, um, Ethereum right now um, isn't quite at the scale that people want. Um, but there's, you know, several really smart guys working on it, and I've had deep, long conversations with them, um, and I'm excited about the directions they're headed, right? So we'll, it will get there, and that's great, because it means that, for example, Ethereum will be able to keep up with BigchainDB. You know, the faster it goes, the better it works for us. Um, but also, you know, we, we've seen it's, it's really hard to develop a decentralized app if you don't have, you know, let's say you're used to being a web programmer where you have... Um, uh, say a, an MVC model, right? Um, so M is for model, which is you know instantiated traditionally as a database. If you don't have that, maybe you only have RAM. What do you do, right? Or a file system. So it's much easier when you have a through and through database to work against. Or you yeah. know the other way of thinking about it, there is the traditional LAMP stack, right? Um, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, where the M, the MySQL for the modern decentralized stack. Uh, so this is sort of roughly like the higher level, right? Sort of partly decentralized, where the database really matters at the core for decentralization. The rest can be centralized. And um, fully decentralized, where you actually have um, all the pieces um, decentralized. And there's shades of gray in between, for example, too, right? You can have um, big chain DB with IPFS, and that's it. And uh, by the way, too, Ascribe itself will be moving towards a fully decentralized deployment bit by bit by bit. So we're working with um, several organizations on that. Quite excited. Uh, for applications themselves, um, maybe I'll just give a quick sampling. Um, one of our um, uh, companies we work with very closely is Everledger. So Everledger is about diamonds on the blockchain, ran by a woman named Leanne Kemp, who is a force of nature. She's really awesome. Um, and she sees that there is major fraud and corruption in the diamond world. Um, and it's basically been a very opaque industry. So, you know, diamonds get dig dug from mines. These mines themselves are often in very corrupt countries. Some com countries are, have actually become so corrupt that they're not, not even allowed to dig diamonds anymore. Um, and then these diamonds, you know, the, these rough stones that come out, um, they um, get um, taken to certification houses. And, well, sorry, cut first, taken to certification houses. There's about five in the world that matter. And um, and then they get measured and certified. And an ID is even laser etched in there, actually. Um, and by the way, on the path of this, there's a Kimber something called the Kimberly process, which um, basically is sort of to help vet if you're authentic or not. And then once it goes past these cert houses, each diamond you know, has this sort of piece of paper that's supposed to be attached with it. And then it gets sent through various um, um, distribution channels that ultimately ends up in the hands of retailers, whether it's online retailers or the local Tiffany's. Um, and uh, uh, basically, each step along the way, there's tons of opportunity for fraud because that piece of paper could get separated from that diamond. That ID might be lying. And there is many, many examples um, that you can see. For example, one of the major cert houses got hacked and their data records um, you know, uh, got very different uh, on the heels of that getting hacked. Um, and if you look at the, the retailers themselves that are selling the diamonds, um, so we actually worked with Everledger, and, and um, what's interesting with blockchain technology, right, it encourages um, companies that are sort of traditional computers, it encourages them to share data in new ways to get sort of an ecosystem-wide benefit. In the case of uh, Everledger, the different certification houses um, shared their data with Everledger, and then we worked with Everledger to cross-reference that data against the retailer data. And we discovered, um, um, basically by cross-referencing that and applying machine learning techniques, we discovered 7% fraud 
on one of the major retailers. Um, there was 20,000 um, diamonds a day going through this retailer. It worked out to $750, $750 million worth of fraud in one year. So um, that's quite exciting. And that's just one retailer. Um, this is pretty important, right? It's an $80 billion industry. The fraud was just 7% from that initial data mining. It could be as high as 30 or 40%. So we're talking up to $32 billion. That's, that's diamonds, but it generalizes. So in general, supply chain transparency is a big deal for the world of blockchain technology. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is this is something that that that, uh, that we're particularly interested in at Stratum is is, is bringing more transparency and and, uh, and auditability to the supply chain. Uh, I want to come back to something yeah, you you, you mentioned earlier, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Is is having that database component mm-hmm. to uh, to a lot of things a lot of the things that people are doing with with blockchain is is, is being able to timestamp things and notarize. And having that component there in that stack is is really essential. We we ask ourselves that question all the time. It's like, okay, well, you know, our clients are going to be notarizing data um, through the Bitcoin blockchain, but where is that data being stored? Like, you know, are they storing that on their servers? Or and in some cases, that doesn't really make sense because you want to have it, and you want to have it decentralized. Um, uh, I want to come back uh, before we sort of wrap up here. I want to come back to the idea that. Um, well, so with, with Bitcoin, you know, we, we have the Bitcoin protocol and, and sort of the core protocol and, and it's released as a, as, you know, as a public blockchain. But a lot of the new protocols that have been emerging, like Ethereum and IPFS and, and now BitchinTB, have this uh, functionality within it to, so that they, they can be public, but they can also be private. And there's some shades of gray in there. So you can be on the Ethereum blockchain, but you can also, um, you know, deploy Ethereum as your own p- private network, if you like, or semi-private network. And so can, can you talk about, uh, so you, you also talked about a lot of the, uh, the public uh, implementation of uh, blockchain DB, and I, I suppose there would be some sort of semi-public or, you know, some fields or, you know, industries that would implement their own implementation of, of, uh, of, block, of uh, blockchain DB and then some totally private um, Im- implementations. I'm particularly interested in the public one because uh, I think that can bring a lot of value. Uh, talk about how you see that playing out. Like, who would be the validating nodes? Like, can anybody join and can anybody use the network? Is it a public good? Is it, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, so um, we're, we're um, spending a lot of energy on this and uh, we'll be uh, having more announcements in coming months on this. Uh, overall, uh, we will be rolling out a foundation for this, um, and um, it will be obviously a nonprofit. We are working with um, organizations um, as nodes that have demonstrated a commitment to the health of the future internet. And um, this is organizations that have demonstrated a care in the past or are demonstrating a care in the future by dedicating real resources to this. Um, and overall, um, the key thing is that uh, permissioning will be set such that anyone can issue an asset, anyone can transfer assets, anyone can read, all of that. Um, and that's really kind of the, the core things, right? And the capacity will be like so big, et cetera, that um, it really can be a, a store of world data. Um, there's some really awesome apps that can emerge on this too, right? Um, the one that gets us excited, actually brings us full circle, is IP. Creative works, right? So um, the the you know what is the mandate of a museum? It's to preserve the cultural history of um, what artists have done o- over the last you know uh, decades and and centuries. Um, and there's cultural mandate in museums and archives and many other places, libraries, etc. Right? Um, what does that look like in the 21st century, in the 22nd century, in the next 10,000 years? Right? It's going to be digital. It's going to. You want to have it live, but you want to have it um, as well, where um, it's you can trust that it's going to be around, right? And that it's immutable, etc. So it's a really great fit. Um, so we're going down a path for this, which is basically we're using a scribe, the company itself, the um, and the product described, the team that's still working on a scribe, to drive us to IP in this public big chain DB and working with other cultural inst- institutions too. For example, we continue to iterate with Creative Commons France um, and a lot of other organizations that really care about this. So 
um, Ascribe, the team actually itself almost acts like a nonprofit, right? Um, it's it's quite well tuned towards the needs, right? We have a lot of people that are, you know, um, art pros, you know, art curators, et cetera, sort of in that space um, that we work with. So, and it's not just art, right? It's not just digital art. It's also things like music and, and books and, and film and video and um, video games and all of these things, right? This is all sort of um, creative cultural artifacts where the attribution deserves to be public and the ownership, the provenance, uh, when people want it, deserves to be public too. So this is a really big killer app. There's also other apps too around this. We see a lot of opportunity, um, lots of companies doing really great things in identity and reputation. And much of this um, makes sense on uh, public big chain DB too, or some other, you know, uh, technology like this at that scale. So, um, and there's others too, right? Some, sometimes things though do need to be more private. You know, a lot of banking things simply to banking regulations, they need to be in private networks. That's fine, right? So there's really sort of shades of gray, but it's really the, the public big chain DB that is, you know, driving us as an organization philosophically. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're excited that we can help to play a role in creating this, this future internet, this future society that we all want. Yeah, that, that, that's a uh, it's an interesting prospect. I mean, the, why would you go, you know, get a MySQL database, or you know, you, it, it it opens up so many possibilities for developing applications without needing any sort of infrastructure. You know, just like the uh, the, the, the 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 I guess the permissionless side of it uh, is is what gets me really going about this. It's just being able to utilize this public good that is uh, much like Bitcoin, much like Ethereum and IPFS and other and other protocols. But um, yeah, and um, so this, this foundation would, I guess, pick the validators and... Yeah, yeah. So the foundation um, will be picking the validators. Um, how we see it though, so right now, um, the technology does not exist to have open membership at scale in a way where you can store all the resor- store all the data you want, right? You have to make a trade-off, right? And so um, some of the other works out there have made the trade-off to say, we're going to allow you know thousands of nodes, but at a severe cost to scale, right? Severe. We've said, um, and, but they're trying to scale up, right? And, and you know, some of the efforts I, I commend in big ways, right? I, I think what like, you know, things like Casper and Special K, awesome, right? And rock on. Um, there's another way to approach it, though. So rather than starting with, um, you know, thousands of nodes as validators, remember you can have hundreds of thousands of all that as clients. So rather than starting with thousands of nodes as validators and trying to add scale, start with um, a smaller number of nodes as validators while still supporting hundreds of thousands or millions of clients. Um, so start with a smaller number of validators, have scale from day one. And then evolve the technology to support a, a larger number of validators, and that's exactly the direction we're going. Where things can be open membership, you know, two years, three years, four years from now, right? Um, with with things like you know, the Stellar Consensus Protocol or other protocols like that, right? So there's some emerging stuff right there too, but um, it's it sort of at the end, uh, we'll, we will all end up at a place where it is broadly decentralized, even in terms of validation, as well as the scale that the planet deserves, right? Um, no one is there yet. Um, we have, a, you know, a scalability um, that the planet deserves, a scale, and um, a, a more limited set of, of, of nodes. What's cool, actually, is we have a prototype for what we're doing, what we've been doing, um, an ar- archetype, if you will. It's called the DNS, right? The DNS has been powering the internet for, the decentralized DNS has been powering the internet since the late 90s. Um, before that, you know, it was actually going back to the 80s, early 80s, it was actually a text file. You know, one guy was maintaining it, you know, for many years, and then he switched over to his buddy, right? And it's kind of amazing, right? And they just kind of had to do it. But, you know, as the internet got more important, it, um, it made sense to decentralize control, and this is what happened. And so we've been working, um, the, archi- the technical architect of the DNS, his name is David Holtzman, and we've actually been working closely with him for more than a year, because this is actually a... Uh, um, you know, a linchpin technology. Now there's things, you know, when when they created the DNS, um, there was the business side too, Jim Rutt, we work with him too. Um, they handed it off to ICANN and, you know, over the, um, from, you know, 1999, 2000 to now, um, you know, ICANN has devolved. It's, it's not as good as it was 15 years ago, right? 
um, there's those challenges. And you know, there were some design challenges, technical in the DNS. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good for the time. Now we have another 15 years worth of learning from crypto, et cetera. Um, and we have all the lessons from ICANN. We're, we're, we're drawing on those lessons you know, for this next gen database for the planet and something that's more broad in scope than the DNS. Um, at the very least for IP, because that's what Ascribe is doing. But we also have a lot of other people who are very interested in using it for a lot of other applications, right? So uh, that excites us. Like I said, it's sort of, it, it drives us. It's what gets us up in the morning. It's, you know, what makes us excited for the future. Well, that's a great note to end on, Trent. I want to thank you for coming on the show once again, and hopefully we can have you on again in the future as, uh, as Big Chain DB uh, continues to evolve. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our listeners for listening. Uh, we are part of the Epicenter, sorry, we're a part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can go to letstalkbitcoin.com to find all kinds of shows about block, block, blockchain, Bitcoin, and decentralized technologies. Uh, you can listen to episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. They come out on your podcast feed as well as Stitcher, YouTube, or anywhere you, where you get your podcasts, um, whether it be iTunes or on Android or wherever. Uh, and to our loyal listeners, uh, you can always leave us a review wherever you can. It could be on iTunes or any other platform. And if you do, just send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a t-shirt and some stickers. Uh, and uh, we thank you for you know, the reviews that you've left so far. It's been uh, really helpful in, in getting the show out to more people. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.